This is the second of two parts of a discussion about wasps you might find in Colorado. This one deals with the social wasps, the wasps that make a colony. And these are by far the wasps that uh, most interact in, with humans and, and people see the most and think about the most when they're thinking about what a wasp is. These are the ones that are involved in essentially all stinging. Now, they are all social wasps, colony producing, but each subgroup produces slightly different types of colonies, and we'll go through all these. And, and the three groups of social wasps that I would like to uh, discuss would, would be one of the yellow jackets, which is the genus Vespula. So it's Vespula pennsylvanica, Vespula atropolosa. And then we have about a half dozen Vespula species here in Colorado. Uh, the social wasp also include the Dolico Vespula species, and there's two of them. Uh, one is the bald-faced hornets, which is a black and white yellow jacket, and uh, the other is called the aerial yellow jacket. Then there are uh, ones that are in the genus Polistes. These we normally call paper wasps, although essentially all of these make nests of paper, but, but the paper wasps are usually the genus Polistes. And then we have a species that's native to Colorado, more in the wooded areas, uh, called the western paper wasp, which has a very long, complicated uh, scientific name, Miscocytarsis flavitarsis. All of the paper wasps uh, construct nests of paper. So there's a bald-faced hornet nest, Dolico vespula upper left, there's a yellow jacket nest in the lower left, and a, a paper wasp nest, European paper wasp nest. All these nests are constructed out of some sort of fiber, and a very common source of these fibers would be from weathered wood. So you might see wasps uh, grinding, gnawing on weathered wood, and then they masticate it, mix it with their saliva, and that's the paper that these nests are made of. And they, they will form uh, the paper to make cells in which they rear their young. They do not store food like a honeybee does. Uh, and they will um, uh, often use it as an envelope around them as well as a protective envelope. All of the social wasps in Colorado produce an annual colony, and that means that every colony is abandoned at the end of the year and never reused, with very few exceptions. The only stage that survives at the end of the season and until the next season are female queens, well-developed, fertile female queens produced late in the year, and they mate with some males that are produced also late in the year and they're hiding somewhere uh, during the winter season, um, and they'll start a brand new colony every year. So uh, if you had a prop colony in a place, uh, someplace last year, this year it probably won't be there. It probably be, you'll have colonies somewhere else. The great majority of the social wasps are predators of other insects. So uh, they will feed on, on insects in your yard and garden, and some of them are extremely uh, important in this regard. They're, they're top predators of, of many kinds of common insects, uh, some of which are, are considered pests. They capture and chew up their prey. They don't bring it back whole. They, they, they form it into bug burger, and that's what they feed their larvae. But some, and notably one in particular, the western yellow jacket, is primarily a scavenger. So they're not going to feed on very many live insects, although they will do that occasionally. Normally, they're going to be feeding on uh, carrion, dead, dead animal material, including meaty foods and fish that you may uh, be dining on outdoors. So yellow jackets are the most important of all the pest wasps, the ones that uh, cause problems with humans, and by far the most important uh, stinging insect group we have. One species in particular is particularly um, problematic in this area, as well as throughout uh, much of the western United States and places like Hawaii and, and uh, New Zealand now as well. Um, it is the most important stinging insect, this western yellow jacket. And by the way, the, uh, you can't really see too well, in the, but the, the, this pattern on the back is how you can tell one species from another. And western yellow jacket has kind of a little diamond there. Uh, in that first segment of the abdomen. Anyway, 
Western yellow jacket feeds its young on animal matter, usually carrion, dead insects. In this case, they're feeding on some uh, chicken, chicken livers that I put in my backyard. And within 20 minutes, they were on them and they are taking out big globs of, of, uh, of flesh and then carrying it back to the colony. Some other examples of them feeding on meaty materials or dead material of animal matter. So there's one chewing on a bit of steak. On the lower left, there's one eating a dead earthworm, and the two on the lower right are feeding on bug splatter that's on a car. But they will also include in their diet, unfortunately, meaty foods that we can wish to consume, and we encounter them when we're doing outdoor dining. These can be a very serious problem in terms of disrupting outdoor activities late in the season when yellow jacket colonies get peak size and they become uh, most important intersecting with uh, humans. They'll also sometimes take sweets. So sweet materials will be part of the, the diet of the adults uh, that helps to sustain them. So they may you know, go into a pop can or they may feed as the one on the lower right is doing, taking some maple syrup off my corn fritters. So the kind of problem that, that yellow jackets uh, can cause, I think many of you are well aware of and, and illustrated here. So in this case, I was having breakfast with my, my niece, and we were having a fine breakfast at the time, uh, having a little, little milk and a cinnamon roll here. And everything was going well until I don't, I don't know, here on the right, trying to circle it, uh, yellow jackets started coming in. And... Uh, uh, my niece is looking uh, pretty brave right here, but but things quickly devolved, and uh, uh, very quickly after these pictures were taken, she fled, and it wasn't helping that her uncle was taking pictures instead of helping out here. But but this kind of thing plays out all the time, and in late summer, uh, where outdoor dining can be disrupted by yellow jackets visiting. Now again, yellow jackets produce a brand new nest every year. Uh, established in the spring by a single queen, but you, you will almost never find a yellow jacket nest or at least uh, anything more than just the, the entrance to that nest because they are always hidden. They are almost always hidden below ground. Uh, they sometimes are hidden in a, in a wall void of a, of a building, usually near the ground level, um, but they're not gonna be out and about. You don't see them, they're, they're hidden somewhere. So this would be an example of a yellow jacket nest that has been excavated from underground. And you can see it's made of paper. There's going to be some layers of the, these uh, that are going to have nest cells in them that I'll show you more pictures of. And it will have been covered by an envelope of paper, uh, which is partly torn away in this photo. Here's another one. This one is a yellow jacket nest that was uh, exposed during uh, evening skunk and raccoon digging. A student brought this in a few years ago. Now that nest form is, again, made of paper. The outside is kind of a parchment envelope and the inside are these cells. They're hexagonal cells made of this paper material they collect and in those will be the young. So here's an adult yellow jacket feeding uh, her young uh, whatever she, she has with her. So the young you can see are uh, the ones that are in the uncapped chambers. The chambers that have got a white cover are young that have finished feeding. They spin a little cover over it, transform to the pupil stage, and then ultimately transform to the adult and emerge. Now, the kind of location of, of yellow jacket nests is often for hidden, and this is part of the issue. Um, so in the case right here, uh, there was a, a nest in a, in a far corner of my property that was in a loose rock wall, a loose brick, brick wall. And the evidence that I could see was a little bit of mud on the outside that had been brought out. So this had probably been, you know, used by perhaps a, a rodent, maybe the a previous year. There's some little cavity in there. And then they expanded to make the colony for the current season. Uh, sometimes you might see that the mud piled. This is not very common, this kind of uh, phenomenon right here. Often there's there's really not much around the nest entrance. Just a little hole might be the size of a quarter or so, and they're going in and out of it. So here's here's a uh, hole at the base of a clump of a, a bunch grass at, uh, right next to where the students dine uh, on the center of campus. So here you can see them. 
and then I hope this would have been um, probably mid-September if I remember and again there's students dining uh, or reading and studying uh, about uh, 20 feet away from here but often the, the nest is inconspicuous you don't see anything um, you know you're out in your garden and you're weeding or doing whatever you, you are and, and you don't you don't usually notice them and but there is there are guards at the entrance and these will uh, often readily come out and defend the nest if they think it's just being disturbed and you don't see them and then all of a sudden you get hit by one maybe a couple uh, yellow jackets and, and where did they come from they were hiding there waiting for you uh, the guards are uh, very quick to defend the colony if they feel it's at any risk they will sting um, and the stinger of wasps is not barbed, so uh, they could conceivably sting more than once, although that's rare. The only insect, by the way, that does have the barbed stinger is the honeybee. The honeybee worker has a barbed stinger that will remain embedded in your skin and she'll pull away, leaving the stinger. If you don't see a stinger after you've been stung, you did not get stung by a, a bee or at least a honeybee. Um, so they, they are not barbed. And I would say that almost all times people say they've been stung by a bee in Colorado, they have not been stung by a bee. I'd say yellow jackets likely cause 90% or more of all the bee stings in Colorado. Uh, often they get blamed for, the bees get blamed for, for activities of, of yellow jacket wasps, and this is not fair. I mean, this is this is like blaming a horse because you got bit by a dog. These are totally different animals, but in general, people don't recognize the difference between a yellow jacket wasp and a honeybee, and it's huge. Uh, and they besmirch the whole reputation of a group of animals, the, the bees, that have very positive impacts in terms of uh, human interests and ecological interests. Anyway. So that's one of the reasons I have a lot of trouble with the Western Yellow Jacket, is it gives bees a bad name because it's confused with them by many people. And are Yellow Jackets pollinators? I mean, people who want to conserve pollinators, and you can see Yellow Jackets and some of these other wasps visiting flowers, but they visit flowers for the adults to sip some nectar, maybe take a little pollen. And, and they may go from one flower to another of the same kind and maybe they might move a bit of pollen, but they are not efficient uh, pollinators. They're not important pollinators. And uh, I, I'd say if you're holding back killing yellow jackets because you're worried about pollinators, go ahead and kill them as far as I'm concerned. Now the yellow jackets nest is again, almost always below ground. You do not see it. Um, uh, and rarely they would be associated with the uh, wall void of a building. So the, the nest is, is hidden, and it's, it, it can be difficult to, to reach. Um, I did a little excavation of one that uh, was in my backyard, and I call it a compost pile. It hadn't been a compost pile for 10 years, probably. Um, and in late September, a couple of years ago, I, I dissected it. Now, now, where the red arrow here is, that's where the entrance was. So I noticed all these yellow jackets coming out. Uh, about a week before this time. And so uh, I want to see what's in it. Uh, so I, I did kill the uh, uh, colony using uh, wasp and hornet spray and then dissected it and, and, and tried to find out what was in there. Where was it? So I had to dig through and about a foot below the surface, I reached the top of the nest. And a more complete excavation, you can see the nest that was in that was maybe about a foot in diameter. You know, kind of football size, but a little a little rounder than a football, not as big as a basketball. But the, the entrance was a good 18 inches away from the entrance of the colony itself. And the reason I make this point is that when we talk about trying to um, use insecticides to uh, control uh, nuisance wasps, um, in the case of yellow jackets, you, you, you direct the insecticide at the nest entrance. But the nest entrance is a twisted tunnel 
some distance away. So uh, it's it's difficult to get the insecticide into it. Uh, that's why sometimes pest control operators we use dusts, insecticides that are dusts that are more easily tracked and then uh, walked and carried back into the colony. Uh, but again, a wasp and hornet spray could be used uh, as long as it's directed into the entrance. You might have to do it multiple times, but uh, that's that's a pretty standard way to get rid of it or just wait for it to be abandoned on itself. So within that uh, yellow jacket nest I excavated here, you can see there are multiple layers of that paper comb. Uh, a lot of them have capped brood, we call it. So those would be the larvae that have spun the little cocoon. Uh, cap on it and uh, are pupating within it. Yes, sir. Annual constructed a new each year. The only stage surviving are fertilized queens, and these are going to be bigger. Um, they're fed better, they're produced at the end of the year, uh, and they get particularly big later as they have uh, start in the next year when they are maturing eggs. So they're big at the end of the year uh, when they go into winter and they become. Uh, fairly, uh, fairly large, uh, fairly uh, larger, uh, quite a bit larger um, in, in late spring when they're maturing eggs and producing uh, eggs that they're laying. So only a few females uh, will survive between seasons. A great many might be produced, but very few make it through winter and very few successfully find a place to, to make a nest. And then survive the whole process of creating nest cells and collecting food and uh, rearing some young uh, to make a successful new colony. Very low survival of this and, and poor weather, rainfall events, uh, you know, cold snaps and the like uh, can have uh, bad effects on, on uh, their ability to survive and successfully establish a colony in spring. Now, uh, in terms of control one very common thing that comes up with yellow jackets are traps. And there are a lot of traps on the market that are sold to catch wasps. And specifically what they catch are yellow jackets, certain kinds of yellow jackets. And there are a lot that uh, are out there and some are, some are uh, pretty good. This one on the left, I think is a very standard one you see uh, most often in the state. It's a dry trap with, uh, that is, um, uh, Sterling rescue trap. Uh, we've done a lot of trials uh, on on various kinds of traps, and usually we'll have a site say, such as this, and have the traps spaced out a bit with different lures or what different designs, whatever we're looking at. And um, always the you know, the common rescue dry trap works. By the way, this is baited with something called heptal butyrate. Two mils is a, is what you find in those little. Um, clear packets that you use for the, the bait here. I'll put it on a little uh, dental wick or cotton ball. And heptobutyrate is, for reasons I'm not sure, uh, but a good attractant for the Western yellow jacket and also prairie yellow jackets, which is another very common species in many parts of the state, certainly in my backyard. They're even more common than Western yellow jackets. That's all they catch though, period. Just those yellow jackets. There are other kinds of traps that uh, I have tested to catch a few more. Um, uh, these are usually liquid traps like the two on the left and uh, the one on the right is kind of a different one with a, a card and a lure attached to it. So there are some slightly better traps, but the whole question comes up, you know, are traps even uh, useful in controlling the insect? They, these are ones that catch uh, yellow jackets well. And there are, by the way, several traps out there, although I think there are fewer over time, that are terrible. I mean, they, they don't catch them. I mean, these are, these are ones we'd, we would test head to head and they would have almost none, sometimes none. There's that one on the, the lower uh, center part, um, you know, baited with apple juice. I never saw a yellow jacket in those, ever. Anyway. Some work, some don't. But are they useful? Now, certainly some traps can catch yellow jackets, but catching yellow jackets doesn't help if, if you still have problems. Are you, are you reducing problems? Are you affecting some sort of control with the trap? 
I think that's very debatable. Um, but if it is, if you are going to use it, the one time I think it makes sense to use it is early in the season. Use traps to target the overwintered queens when they're trying to make a new colony, maybe late April, early May, and then into uh, mid-June. Uh, during this time, they're very susceptible, and all you have is queens. So as an example, a uh, couple, couple years I uh, have looked at every yellow jacket that came into my, my trap each week through the summer. And this happens to be 2007. And I didn't start this until a little bit later. Uh, usually I start them in uh, the middle of uh, April, and, and often I've caught some by the 20th of April in Fort Collins. But here, in this year, I started a little late. And so the first week, May 7th to the 14th, I think uh, you can see the, the wasps are very large. These are all female queens, uh, they're all, the, all of them are females, but these are queens that overwintered, and many of them are, are already starting to mature uh, their eggs, uh, so they've swollen quite a bit too, but they're entirely queens that first week. They are entirely queens until a month later when I start to see some of the smaller workers on the right of this picture right here. And when we get into the uh, end of June and July, there are no more queens captured. I think in this picture, there's a queen here on June 27th, July 3rd. And there's a couple of them up here two weeks before that. The workers will get a little bigger over time. The very first workers you'll see often are very small because they were not well fed. And as more workers are available, they can feed the colony better. And the workers tend to get a little bit bigger uh, over time, but you'll see small undernourished ones, as well as uh, better nourished workers. The workers are females that are infertile and not uh, fed as uh, complete a diet as the uh, uh, ones that are going to be queens that are fed. By the way, another thing that you do not catch in traps are any queens after uh, middle of June or so. That You don't get any of the queens produced late in the season. I've uh, done this many times into uh, even November, and never have I caught a queen, overwintered queen, for, uh, at the end of the season. The only time queens are attracted to these traps are uh, early in spring. Now, moving on to some lesser groups uh, in terms of stinging issues, but the, the insects I sometimes call hornets uh, would be in the genus Dolico vespula. This is not a correct the term hornet should be given to the uh, insects like the uh, giant Asian hornet and the European hornet in the genus Vespa. But uh, we have two species in Colorado, and both are predators of live insects. Neither visits dining areas for food. They'll stay out of your way. And the reason I call them hornets is just that one, and I used to see this all the time as a kid, uh, is called the bald-faced hornet. And it is the black and white yellow jacket, if you will. Uh, but this is one that nests in trees and, and sometimes shrubbery, uh, makes a big uh, cart nest uh, that is very uh, um, characteristic and, and something people uh, I'm sure have seen at one, one, one or more occasions. The, these are not aggressive wasps. Um, they, they do not, I think, nearly as readily come out and attack you. You leave them alone, they're usually going to leave you alone. I, I've, I've been stung by far many more more yellow jackets than uh, bald-faced hornets. In this case, there's some that are uh, out uh, being a little aggressive uh, on the outside of a colony that happened to be uh, produced pretty near ground level in a shrub. But this picture uh, was taken about a half an hour after I had previously gone to this colony and beat on it so I could collect some with my sweep net. Um, so yeah, they're a little upset, but even then I got this close and they didn't sting me. The uh, colony is going to start from a single overwintered queen like all of these do. And they will make the nest. It'll be some cells, then it will be covered with an envelope, and they'll rear young, and they'll pull it apart and expand it and reform it. And here we see a sequence from uh, Ken, the Ken Gray collection. Uh, as you can see, it getting bigger and bigger. On the one on the lower right, it's purple. So who knows what happened there? They must have found some maybe purple cardboard 
and they use that. Uh, the, the nest uh, at the end of the season is uh, very similar to the nest that I showed you of the yellow jacket, uh, only this one's hanging, uh, exposed, hanging under some uh, eave or uh, on a tree or something like that. And inside will be the cells that are used to rear their young. The second of the two species has the common name aerial yellow jacket. And this is a yellow and black uh, uh, insect, unlike the bald-faced hornet. Both of these are in the genus Dolico vespula. Both of them are predators. This one tends to go after flies. Uh, so you have some, uh, you put out you know, some dead, uh, you know, uh, some chicken livers or something in the backyard to see what's going to feed on it, like I do many times. And uh, one of the first things will, will come will be the yellow jackets, the western yellow jackets, as well as some of the, the blow flies. And then you see the aerial yellow jackets picking off the flies. Uh, they come they're not eating the meat, they're eating the flies that are visiting the meat. These are the ones that I tend to see most often if they're attached to a building or sometimes even partially in the building. I had uh, kind of a, a, a soffit that had a little opening and they were kind of half, the nest was half in the uh, inside and half outside. Uh, but these, these will often nest on a building. Again, neither of these uh, have a barbed stinger none do, uh, so they could sting, they could sting repeatedly. And finally, there's the paper wasps, and almost all the paper wasps are in the genus Polistes. Uh, we do have that uh, western yellow jacket, uh, excuse me, western uh, paper wasp uh, that is in a different genus that's native. And here's one that is chewing those wood fibers to make those nests, uh, and the nests are going to be um, the same kind of hexagonal cell form but they are not going to be enclosed by a paper envelope. They're going to usually be hanging vertically. In this case, it doesn't show it vertically. It's coming from the side from a little pedestal. And uh, again, not enclosed. The nests are not nearly as big as those of the other two kinds of uh, wasp we just talked about. But within those cells, again, that's where the larvae are reared. So the female will lay eggs. There's some eggs in the a picture in the upper left, the eggs will hatch. You'll have larvae that will uh, develop in those cells. And ultimately, in the lower right, uh, they will pupate within those cells after they have capped it over with a little bit of uh, silk. So there is a paper wasp larva in a cell, and, and she's waiting for uh, one of the other uh, workers to uh, feed her. And, and the Workers go out and collect food and chew it into bug burger and bring it back and feed it to their, their young. Now, we have always had paper wasps in Colorado, a few species of paper wasps native to Colorado, and the kinds of native paper wasps that occur in this part of the country tend to be more orange or yellows, uh, something you see in hotter, drier kinds of sites, that kind of color. Uh, for, so, for instance, uh, this one on the lower right, uh, uh, in, in, uh, if you see it in a more northern area of the United States, it would be a lot darker than we would see it in Colorado. And they will produce these nests uh, in some hidden site, uh, might be underneath the eave, um, or uh, the picture in the, in the lower left is one that was behind my faux shutters I had years ago when I was painting. Painting them, that's the western paper wasp there. But the paper wasp situation in this state totally changed when we got taken over by a, a new highly invasive species called the European paper wasp, Polistes dominula. Uh, first gotten in the United States in 1976. 22 years later, it was being found in uh, western Colorado. And a few years after that, it was found in eastern Colorado. So, so once this insect got a, finally got a bridgehead into North America, it spread extremely rapidly. This is a uh, yellow and black paper wasp. It's very similar in, in the colors of, of a, a yellow jacket, like the Western yellow jacket. And they, they'll often nest in cavities, sometimes underneath an eave, uh, but they, they like a little protection if they can. So in this case, they, they found a little cavity in a, in a uh, support beam that had an access hole in, in it. Uh, they might be, you know, underneath the, 
if your, your outdoor grill, you open up your outdoor grill on, uh, Labor, on Memorial Day and, and now you see paper wasps in it. That never happened. But they can also nest in places that can cause them to interact with people in a, in a bad way. So they may be nesting in a place where we don't see them. So in this case, they're nesting in a porch, a little porch swing I've got next door. Uh, or here they are in the uh, end, end pipe they, uh, of the clothesline I have. And, and they particularly like to nest in weathered wood or, or, or old metal. Uh, it's got a little rough uh, because of the uh, corrosion. So here, here they are in that clothesline next door. There's the nest. I think you can see it in here. Uh, and then here's my wife putting out her clothes and wondering why I'm taking pictures of, of her putting up the clothes. But... Uh, they fortunately did not sting her. They rarely sting. Uh, come back to that. But all sorts of places they could nest. Somebody puts a boot out on a, on a post and there's a nest there. Ultimately, uh, the nest uh, reaches maximum size. And, and this is what I would say is a fairly large, an above average uh, size late season nest of European paper wasps. Sometimes they're quite a bit bigger. Excuse me, quite a bit smaller. So this insect has had a huge impact in uh, the ecology of residential areas. This the European paper wasp likes to nest near where people live. They, this, is, this is the most common paper wasp of Southern Europe and, and parts of Northern Africa on the Mediterranean. Um, and it loves it here in Colorado, but they, you, you rarely would see that much beyond you know, a house, a farm, uh, out in, in uh, uh, fields very far away, but a backyard where there's lots of places to, uh, where they might find area in a nest. These do really well. So this European paper wasp it has several big impacts. Uh, it's added a significant new stinging insect to the region. It's highly visible. It had negative, question mark, uh, depending on if you think it's negative, impacts on yard and garden Lepidoptera. We'll come back to all these. And it stimulated inappropriate purchases of wasp traps. So the, the big thing is, it, is it's a visible wasp. People see wasp nests now way more than they did 20 years ago because of this insect. It nests everywhere. Uh, and, and people rarely saw nests of the native uh, paper wasps. This is far more abundant than the native paper wasp are. Stings can occur. Uh, I would say they're infrequent. This is not an aggressive insect compared to a yellow jacket, but people get stung. Uh, I finally got stung, uh, uh, and I, but I, I've taken pictures of it, you know, right next, right next to it. I, I knock their colonies off the, the eaves with my hands, and I've never gotten stung except for just once in 2020, uh, but didn't hurt much. And it also caused a lot of confusion because the European paper wasp in the upper left looks, again, a lot like the yellow jacket, which people have long associated with as being a very uh, serious uh, uh, nuisance kind of insect because it breaks up outdoor dining. Um, these are difficult to tell apart. And this is kind of a uh, odd picture because it's showing wasp at a hummingbird feeder, and most of them in this picture are paper wasps. Almost always, it's usually yellow jackets. But here, just uh, outlined with that uh, uh, the, the uh, container of the sugar water, you can see a paper wasp with the legs spread. And here's one, uh, another one with the classic long legs of the paper wasps uh, trailing. Yellow jackets don't do that. Uh, the, the body of the paper wasp is a little bit longer and leaner. That's a kind of a difficult thing to, to uh, recognize. But uh, again, a European paper wasp on the left and a Western yellow jacket uh, on the right. Now, by impacts on yard and garden lepidoptera, what I mean is caterpillars, larvae of insects in the order lepidoptera, are one of the most favored food of a, a foraging European paper wasp and, and other paper wasps that are looking for something to feed to their young. So uh, two insects that had, were, were extremely common, regularly occurring in my yard and garden uh, when I first moved to 
Fort Collins in the early 1980s and, and a subject we would always talk about for years in Master Gardeners uh, in the limited time we had would be cabbage worms, uh, the caterpillars that chew cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower and the like uh, uh, and turn into a, a very common white butterfly. And then the hornworms, the tobacco hornworm or the tomato hornworm that would chew tomatoes, impressive insects that, that uh, would attract quite a bit of attention. Um, these are these are both prey of the European paper wasp, and so uh, formerly you might see cabbage that looked like this and very typical, and, unless you treated it with you know BT or something. But since we've had European paper wasps, I have never seen another uh, uh, cabbage or broccoli that's remotely damaged to the extent that it used to be. Occasionally particularly out in a, in a more rural area where there's fewer paper wasps. I'll still see this, but, but not in residential areas. It just doesn't happen. They have taken them out. They, they may get a few caterpillars, but, but these wasps, when they build their numbers, and, and they're in good numbers by the end of June, I mean, they don't miss anything or miss very few caterpillars. They're gone. So is this bad? Good? Um, well, I mean, people didn't like to have caterpillars on their, their cabbage and broccoli. Um, and you don't have to, people don't be spraying for that anymore. Um, on the other hand, they take out caterpillars that turn into butterflies that we like. Um, I haven't been able to rear a, a parsley worm. One of my favorite caterpillars comes out the parsley and turns into the black swallowtail for 15 years because they're slaughtered in my yard by these European paper wasps. These traps do not capture the European paper wasp or any other paper wasp. And these traps, sales of these traps, went through the roof after European paper wasps came into Colorado. When that happened, people started to see nests all over the place. So they say it's a wasp nest, then they go to the hardware store or the nursery or wherever they, they make their purchases and, and started buying wasp traps. And they get a lot of insects in a wasp trap. But what you get in a wasp trap are western yellow jackets and prairie yellow jackets. You get not one European paper wasp or one in, you know, every you know, 10 years you might get one that will blunder into it. It's not attractive to them. So, so people buy a trap because they see a paper wasp nest, but they get not one of the insect that made the nest that made them go buy the trap in that trap. So anyway, that's why I would say... Uh, inappropriate purchases. There is no good trap for the European paper wasp. I mean, there's there's traps sold for it, but they're worthless. There there is nothing on the market that is a good uh, trap for the European paper wasp. These are two again very different insects: the European paper wasp and the Western yellow jacket. The European paper wasp is a top predator of insects, including many garden pests and including larvae of butterflies. Uh, but it's a predator. It eats live insects, turns them into bud burger, feeds their young. Whereas the western yellow jacket is a scavenger, commonly visits food and garbage. Um, this is the one that disrupts outdoor dining. The European paper wasp does not. The European paper wasp makes an open nest, meaning it's not enclosed in, uh, in a paper envelope. It's above ground, maybe in a little uh, cavity. But the western yellow jacket makes a covered nest. It is below ground and hidden. You do not see it. I think the European paper wasp is is very relatively relatively speaking non-aggressive. Other people disagree with this, but but again, I have gone out of my way to bother this insect over the years, and only in one occasion have I ever been stung. Whereas the western yellow jacket readily stings when the nest is disturbed. And the European paper wasp is not attracted to wasp traps, whereas the Western yellow jacket is. So that's it. Two-part uh, series on wasps. Uh, I hope uh, some of this has been of interest, and I have to think of what, what next I should talk about.